All right. So for most of us, perhaps our first memory of proofs are mathematical proofs that we learn about in school. And uh, what does a mathematical proof achieve? So it allows a prover to assert a claim to somebody else, let's say a verifier, and then show that this claim is actually correct. So in this case, uh, you know, uh, Andrew Wiles is actually giving a proof of Fermat's last theorem, the famous uh, you know, problem that was only resolved uh, by his proof. And um, one basic uh, ability or one basic promise of mathematical proofs is this property that we call uh, soundness. And this property basically says that if the claim is false, then any proof is rejected, right? And in fact, this property is what speaks to the heart of you know, why mathematical proofs are so amazing, because I don't now need to trust anyone that a claim is true. I can simply ask them to prove it to me, right? So the topic of today's talk, though, is, uh, is cryptographic proofs. And cryptographic proofs first try to mimic all the properties of mathematical proofs, but in fact go much, much beyond. So one of those properties that I'd want to talk about today is what is called uh, succinctness. And this property basically says that no matter how complex the proof is, no matter how complex the statement is, so for example, even if I'm proving Fermat's last theorem, where the original proof actually required an entire annals of mathematics to actually write down the proof, now I don't need to do that. I can actually send you something which is very, very short and very fast to verify. So this is, the, this is what is called succinct proof, and the short name for it is SNOX, which basically says succinct, non-interactive argument, succinct because it's small, and non-interactive because just like mathematical proofs, it just takes one message to communicate. So this sounds amazing, right? Let, let me try to formalize it a little bit, and then I'll tell you what we can hope to do with this. So a little bit more formally, a succinct non-interactive argument involves a prover who wants to claim, let's say that some very, very large computation, which may take time t, t could be very large to actually perform. Now he wants to claim to somebody else that actually the output of this computation on certain input is let's say some value y, in this case one. And now one way to just show that this claim is correct is simply to have the verifier re-perform this very large computation and then check it for itself. But this would take a very long time. So instead, what we want is that the prover can just send a very short proof, much, much smaller than t, to actually convince a verifier. So the key property here is succinctness, that the proof size and the verification time does not depend upon t. Okay? And just like mathematical proofs, they are also sound, namely that if the claim is false, then the verifier should not accept the proof. Okay? So this sounds amazing. Let's see what we can do with it. So the first natural application is delegation of computation. So let's say I want to train some very, very large neural network. I don't have the resources to do it myself, so instead I rent services from some cloud service provider and ask them to actually do the training for me. Now let's say you know, the, the cloud service provider does it right, and sends me back some answer. Now how do I know that it actually did the training according to my specification? Right? I could retrain it myself, but then what's the point? Right? The, the reason I asked the cloud to do it is because I could not have done it myself. So if the neural network is very, very large, right, then I want to be able to verify that the training was done correctly without having to run time that takes to actually train the neural network. So again, in this case, what we can ask is the cloud to just send me a very short proof that the training was done correctly. And because the proof is short, I can verify it very quickly. Another application is to blockchains. So what is a blockchain? Simply put, it's just a collection of transactions which are stored in a ledger. The ledger is distributed, meaning that many parties on the internet actually store this ledger. And one major problem with blockchains is scalability. If we want to have a large number of transactions per second, we now need to store all of them right, across all of these millions of machines across the internet, and this creates bottlenecks in scalability. So one idea that we can use to actually solve this problem is via SNARKs. The idea is that instead of asking all the computers on the internet to actually store all, the, all of these transactions, we can just store them in one or two places and now just post a short proof which says that a gazillion transactions are all valid. And because this proof is sound, I don't need to worry about checking all of these transactions myself. One more application, let's say, is Electronics, electronic voting. So let's say I want to you know, do some voting on the internet, and uh, the way I, I do the voting is that I ask every, every participant or every voter to actually sign, you know, release their signature on the name of, let's say, the, uh, the candidate that they prefer. 
Okay? So now I have all of these signatures, and now let's say I am the authority, I want to certify that, that the answer, that the, that the result of the voting is in, in the favor of some, some candidate. Okay? So I could publish all of these signatures, but that would be very large. Right? So instead, what I can ask is, can I actually publish some very small aggregated signature, which is only verifiable if a majority of the voters actually voted for a certain participant? So how do I compute this aggregated signature? Again, I can use a SNARK to actually do this. So we have all of these uh, you know, amazing practical applications of SNARKs. It turns out that the idea of SNARKs also has a lot of connections, deep connections, with areas in theoretical computer science and, in fact, many other areas of computer science at large. So this brings us then to the question, can we actually build them? Right? So you should not be surprised that I'm not the first one to ask this question. In fact, the idea of SNARKs has captured the imagination of researchers for many, many years now, and there are thousands of papers on this topic. Uh, so before I actually give you the answer to this question, let me just point out to the main challenge of why this problem is hard in, in the first place. Okay? So what is the challenge? So suppose I want to prove a claim to you, right? So I collect all of this evidence, right, which may take a lot of space. Somehow I need to compress all of this evidence into a short proof. So because the proof is short, clearly, information theoretically, it, can, it cannot contain all of the evidence inside it, right? It's short. So if that is the case, how do I actually prove soundness, right? Because even incorrect evidence could get mapped to this short proof, right? So how do I prove, actually, that correct evidence exists? So this actually is, uh, you know, this is a barrier, information theoretic barrier. And, you know, these kind of barriers we face all the time in cryptography. And in this case, the way we resolve this barrier is how we have done it many, many times before. So we will change the soundness property. We will say that the soundness property only holds if some mathematical problem is hard. Okay? So let's say it is hard to factor large numbers or it is hard to solve noisy linear equations, then soundness holds. Okay? But now you will ask, okay, even if I make such assumptions, how do I still prove soundness? It seems very hard. And indeed, people have investigated this. And several years ago, uh, Gentry and Wix actually showed that, you know, you can try to work very hard, but still, this is going to be, this is going to be unlikely. You are not really going to be able to build these objects, uh, at least not from the nice assumptions that we want to use to build other cryptographic primitives, like public key encryption, and so on and so forth. But it turns out there were lots of caveats you know, with this result in the sense that there were lots of conditions under which this impossibility result was proven. Rather than stating all of these, uh, these conditions, let me just say the result basically says it is very hard to build snarks unless you get really, really creative. Okay? So that's sort of the takeaway. So, so let me now show you some workarounds that researchers have developed over the last several years to actually beat this impossibility result. So the first workaround is simply, you know, let's assume that we can read minds. Okay? So let's make this assumption that I can read people's minds. So now, if I could do that, if I really had this ability, then what could I do? Suppose somebody comes and makes a claim that here is the proof, this statement is true. Okay? So if I could actually read that person's mind, then I could essentially probe their you know, brain activity while they generated this small proof. And by probing that brain activity, perhaps I could just reverse engineer the entire evidence that actually they must have had in their mind to generate this proof. Right? OK, so I'm not going to show you how this actually works. Obviously, I don't know how to build such uh, mind-reading algorithms. But uh, we can still make this assumption in a clean mathematical way. And it turns out that if I make such an assumption, then we can actually build amazing snarks. We can make snarks that are very, very efficient and are, in fact, being deployed in practice. In fact, SNARKs based on such kind of assumptions are at the heart of now a multi-billion dollar industry. There are several, several companies that are you know, building them and actually also deploying them in practice, uh, in, for example, in many blockchain uh, companies. OK, so what is the caveat? Well, the caveat is we really don't know how to build such uh, mind-reading algorithms from nice assumptions. So this is, uh, you know, but I should state that we don't know how to break the security of snarks that are based on such assumptions. We just don't like the assumptions that are used. Okay, so a second workaround. Let's assume God exists, okay? So now, if that is the case, then, 
you know, instead of sim simply sending my large evidence to you, what I could do is I could first submit, let's say, all of my evidence to God. God verifies that, okay, my evidence is correct. And now God will just sign, okay, look, this claim is correct. Here is my signature. Please verify it, and you can trust me that, you know, I verified everything, right? And because it's God, we know nobody can steal God's key, signing key, so nobody can fabricate these signatures, okay? So this works, right? But, you know, now you'll ask, okay, does God really exist? Okay, so for the, all the non-believers amongst you, it turns out that Sahai Waters showed several years ago that you can actually replace God in this mechanism with some program, okay? And then you can obfuscate this program, and by obfuscating this program, you can be sure that the signing key will never be leaked, okay? And now, if that is the case, then you can implement this idea using program obfuscation, and you're good to go. And as we just talked about earlier, uh, you know, program obfuscation can be shown to exist, in fact, from pretty nice assumptions. We are not ecstatic about the assumptions that are used to build program obfuscation, but we are pretty happy in the sense that uh, these are assumptions that we think will likely hold the test of time, but they are not in the same league as, for example, the assumptions used for building public encryption. Okay, so that's great. Um, what's the bad? So, so the bad thing here is that uh, first, this program obfuscation could be very large, and we have to ask who is actually generating it. So we still need to trust somebody else to actually generate this large program obfuscation. And philosophically, you could ask, are we really compressing evidence you know, here? Are we really gaining some new insight about how to compress uh, witnesses or evidence? Okay, so let me now come to the last uh, idea. So the third workaround is to actually change the problem statement. Okay? So earlier I said I want to prove one claim to you, that you know, one claim is valid. Now, instead, I will try to prove multiple claims simultaneously. So you'll ask, okay, you are just making your life harder, right? If you couldn't prove succinctly one claim is true, how could you prove multiple claims succinctly? You know, correctness of multiple claims succinctly. So I'm going to change the problem statement a little bit. So suppose I have some T number of statements that I want to prove. I'm allowing my proof size to grow with the size of the evidence required to prove one claim, but overall, I want my proof size to be much, much smaller than the number of claims, okay? So the proof size cannot grow with T, but it can grow with the size of the evidence required for proving one claim. So this is an easier problem, because information theoretically, I can hope to catch you know, an, an adversary in one lie. I cannot hope to catch him in all of the potential lies, but at least one lie, because the proof grows with the size of the evidence for one claim. Okay, so it turns out that this problem can actually be solved from standard assumptions, basically assumptions that we know and use to build a public encryption. So it turns out that this problem can be solved. Um, and in fact, this problem is already very useful for some of the applications I mentioned earlier. For example, batch proofs are sufficient to build scalable blockchains in the sense that if I want to prove that a large number of transactions are valid, it's a state, you know, I'm, I'm trying to prove that multiple statements are true, right? That T transactions are valid. It's a batch statement, so I can prove it using batch proofs. So they already suffice for this problem. And they also suffice for electronic voting. Here I need a slightly stronger form of batch proof, but we also know how to build that. Okay, so the last point I want to say is that, okay, let's go back to our original question where I just wanted to prove a single claim, right? I don't have T claims, I just have a single claim to prove. What could I still hope to do in this setting? So there's a very natural idea that I could try, right? So what I will do is that I will take my, large, my claim, which let's say involves T steps of computation, where T could be very large, I just break down this entire computation into smaller parts, right, in this form. So here, now I can just write it down as T claims, where the first claim says, okay, the first step of my computation is correct. The second claim says that the second step of my computation is correct, and so on. Now, once again, I have T claims, or you know, a batch of claims, and now I can just hope to use the same proof system as before. Right? Again, use a batch proof to actually prove that even a single claim is true by just simply breaking it down into T smaller claims. So does this work? Well, it doesn't work right out of the box because unlike earlier where all of the T claims were independent, here the T claims are actually correlated. Right? 
because the second step of my computation depends on the previous one, and so on and so forth, right? So these, all of these claims are correlated, and this creates challenges in proving soundness. And uh, what we have done over the last few years is actually develop techniques to actually solve this correlation problem, at least for some kinds of computation. We still do not know how to solve it fully, but progress is being made. So let me, um, let me summarize. So hopefully I've tried to convince you that uh, uh, SNARKs, or succinct proofs in general, are amazing, and they have captured the imagination of practitioners and theoreticians alike. Um, if you are on the practice side, then perhaps you already think that SNARKs exist, and the main thing that you are interested in is how fast can we make them, right? So we can make verification already very fast, and we can also make the proof size very small, but uh, what about the prover time? Does it take very long to, you know, for the prover to actually compute these certificates? So this is actually one of the main topics of research in this area, at least if you are a practitioner. If you are a theoretician, then, you know, there are still many fundamental problems that we need to solve. Going back to Brent's point about, uh, you know, can we actually build these things from standard, like, you know, simple assumptions that we have used for many years? And this kind of question still remains. Uh, for SNARKs, at least for general languages. For many, many uh, languages or many kinds of computations, rather, we know how to build them already. Uh, and I think uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs>